Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, as Josh said, our session is called From Them to Us, Demystifying Drupal Contribution. Um, I'll just give you a quick overview. So Lee and I are going to each talk a little bit about how we started contributing and then how we ended up joining the committer team. I'm going to go through a little bit about who contributes to Drupal. Um, Lee's going to talk about how you can get started on your contribution journey, or if you've already started it, how to progress it. And then we hope you have some questions at the end. My name is Pam. I'm the um, CTO of Technocrat, which is a remote Drupal agency primarily based in Australia. And I'm also currently the core committer team facilitator, which means I help with meetings, release notes, and other coordination tasks. Um, I've been contributing to Drupal since 2012. And my first core patch was in 2013. And it was actually also the first um, Drupal core issue that I created. So um, I think I probably you know, nervously followed all the instructions. And I created an issue for this visual regression that I saw. There was just a text contrast issue with the shortcut links. And up to that point, I had been involved in going to meetups. And I had um, been to many conferences and, and um, had done a little bit of organizing. But I hadn't ever really made a um, Drupal.org contribution. So I created the ticket, and I thought that was the end. I was you know, very proud of myself. And then um, Mike Gifford, who is a longtime Drupal well-known contributor, he's the accessibility maintainer, replied to my issue saying, yeah, it looks great. Can you roll a patch? And I thought, oh, uh, <laughs> hadn't planned on rolling a patch, but you know, I know how to write CSS, so I'll give it a go. And I think probably with a lot of encouragement and assistance from uh, Lee, who I was working with at the time. So I'd never actually done a patch at all, let alone you know in Drupal, let alone anywhere. So um, I had a go. In the end, I actually created four patches because there were a few problems. So for one thing, um, I didn't know about right to left styles, so I had to redo it for that. And there was just some general feedback about um, CSS and core. So I, not, not only did I learn a bit about that, but I also learned that there's no such thing as um, a simple CSS patch in core. Um, and then within a month, um, this issue was committed by Angie, and I found this comment just to be really super encouraging. This, this whole experience was really positive for me because not only did I start off thinking, you know, my contribution was minor, you know, I was going to create the issue. In the end, I actually fixed the issue. Um, and this really felt like a transition to me. I, I felt really welcome, and um, it really made me feel like part of the community. So even, even from, you know, from Mike, who didn't know me, had no idea who I was, just to say, hey, can you roll a patch? That was a huge, um, that was a huge uh, motivation for me, because I think otherwise I probably would have been too shy or too nervous. But you know, he didn't know who I was. He said, all right, yeah, can you write a patch? And I was like, yeah, OK, sure. So um, my path from that first patch to joining the committer team is kind of long and winding, which you'll see later. Lee's is a bit more sort of linear. Um, I started attending Sydney meetups in late 2011 and connected with agencies. I started working at Previous Next in 2012, uh, which um, encouraged me to contribute, and they funded a lot of that contribution. Um, I attended a lot of conferences, did some conference organizing, spoke at conferences, and attended Drupal cons in the US and um, Europe as well, which was great because I met a lot of contributors from around the world. And that was a really important part of the contribution journey for me because not only did I make connections that kind of maintained over the years, but um, just kind of uh, became someone who was known in the community for, for volunteering. So I did core um, con contribu contribution sprint mentoring. I helped organize a Drupal camp in New York City. Um, all these different kinds of things led me to meet people and pursue opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, I took some time off from working in general. And then when I came back, I um, started getting back into Drupal. And at the same time, they were looking for a, um, a, a committer team facilitator, which was a new role that they were kind of trialing. And um, they invited me to join. Just a quick note as well, we're looking for more facilitators. Um, we would love to have more than one, but so far we've been sort of unsuccessful in, um, in recruiting. So then just since 2019, I've been doing the Core Computer Facilitator, and then I've also gotten involved in the Bug Smash Initiative, which I'll talk a little bit about. And one thing I'll talk about later, one thing I just want to highlight as well is that most of my contributions to date are not coding. So where Lee's path is very much centered around um, development and coding, mine is pretty much on the edges of that. So now I'm just going to hand over to Lee to talk about his journey. Hi, everyone. So yeah, I'm Lee Rollins. Uh, you can find me as LA Rollin on most places on the internet. And uh, my current role in the project is Core Framework Manager. And my first core patch was to do with theming. So uh, as you would know, you get a page dot, well, it was tpl.php in the day, and for every like pattern in the path, 
it would make a, a new theme suggestion, so page dash dash node. And it was broken if your path had a hyphen in it. And so um, yeah, that was my first patch, and it was the same sort of experience as Pam. Um, a lot of encouragement from people. I had to write a test to go with it, never written a test, and you know, the community sort of encouraged me to, to do that. And my contribution path, uh, I actually came to Drupal from Ubercart. See on the left. I, I had an account on the Ubercart site for 15 weeks before I joined the Drupal account, uh, the Drupal site, and and my journey into contribution was through Ubercart. So I was a maintainer of the the UC Hotel module. Anyone ever use that? That was oh one. I, I was expecting that to be zero. Yeah. Uh, so back in the day, uh, if you were able to commit to uh, any module, then you could create any modules that you liked. It was much uh, easier to get involved at that point. So I started adding more modules, and most of them were to do with Ubercart. And then I started to drift towards the core issue queue, um, mostly as a lurker to start with. So I would follow a lot of issues um, and sort of watch the dynamics between contributors. And it did seem to me like this far off um, you know, sphere that I was outside the bubble. I, I wasn't part of that. Um, and they were kind of like, I thought that was an elite group of developers, for example. So I started contributing a few fixes for Drupal 7, things like the one I saw before. And one day I saw an issue which was a call to action, which was make uh, core maintainable. So this uh, QR code is the link to the, the issue. But it was effectively a cry for help from Drupal core developers at the time. Drupal 7 had just come out. There were thousands of bugs. There were modules that had kind of been added to core and no one was supporting them, like shortcut, overlay, uh, toolbar, if anyone remembers any of these modules. And so um, I thought, well, I use Drupal. I kind of know what I'm doing. and it's part of my income source, so I'll go and put my hand up. And this is a blog post from Chicks, who's a long-time Drupal contributor, wrote the form API. He said, yesterday I saw this guy on IRC who said he'd look after the forum module. And so I opened an issue for it, and again, Angie was the person to commit that. Uh, awesome. It was a very, um, very welcoming experience. And I think the thing to note here is that I wasn't asked to do this. Um, there was no you must pass these five tests to be admitted type thing. It was like, thank you, we'd love the help, Come, you know, welcome aboard. So I think, um, as with Pam said before, that it's a very welcome experience and uh, don't feel it. The, the impression that I had originally that was this walled garden was completely, completely wrong. So from that point, I got involved in a lot of Drupal 8 initiatives and I learned a lot along the way and I kept writing patches. Um, for two and a half years, I did one patch a day just to try and help get Drupal 8 out. That was the sort of thing I started and I learned a lot. And um, fast forward six years, I got an email from Dries and said, hey, would you like to be a core contributor, a core main, uh, committer? And obviously the first, um, my first reaction was very much uh, imposter syndrome. I didn't think that I was up to that, but I thought I'd uh, be mad to say no to that. And so I was brought on as a provisional committer, which meant you can only commit to the unreleased branch, so for example, um, that would be 10.2 in the current state. And um, yeah, after that was very welcome again, and after 12 months I was promoted to a full uh, committer. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm going to pass back to Pam now. So there are two reasons that I really wanted to do this session. Um, the first is just to show how it all happens. So as Lee said, he just did a lot, he volunteered for stuff, and then eventually he got an email from Dries inviting him to be a core, a core committer. And the second reason was just to gently nudge the conversation around core development and, and the release cycle away from the mentality that Lee alluded to earlier of like, there's this group of they, that the, the core developers, who are separate to me, I have no link to them whatsoever, they're making decisions that um, I don't understand and just kind of like scoffing, you know, you, you say things like, oh yeah, you know, of course that bug's been open for 10 years, you know, it's Drupal, um, you know, there's no docs, the docs are terrible in Drupal or, you know, that's probably not going to happen because it's Drupal. And I'd really just like to reframe the thinking around this. Because really, Drupal is just the output of a very large group of people um, who are mostly volunteering their time. So it's really good, I think, to keep this in mind when you're making generalizations or complaining about stuff. Um, if you are here, you are a user of Drupal, and so you are a part of the us, you know, in some way or another. Um, there's a blog post that uh, Jess, one of the core committers, 
wrote about this, which is linked in the QR code there, just about you know the, the thing that you're complaining about or the thing that you're criticizing, someone probably spent a lot of time on that. So just something to think about. And um, just quickly going through kind of who the people are that contribute, there are sort of different types. So there are contributors, which is just anybody, pretty much anybody who participates in um, an issue. So creating it, testing it, triaging, um, writing a patch, whatever it is. Um, there are thousands of these in any given year. Um, I think upwards of uh, nearly 4,000 people commit, um, contributed to Drupal 8. Um, there's no gate for this one, so anyone can do it. All you have to do is create a Drupal.org account and, again, create an issue, comment on an issue, whatever it is. Then there are maintainers, and there are a few dozen of these, probably less than 100. Um, these are people who've put their hand up to oversee a particular part of core or, um, or a subsystem, and they're generally a subject matter expert. So as Lee said before, he did that for the forum module originally. That's how he kind of um, made, made a jump in his contribution. They review issues. They um, make decisions about these subsystems, but they ultimately um, they don't commit. So the committers are then the sort of last uh, group, which are there are about 18 on the core committer team now. They have right access to the code, and they're the sort of final gatekeepers. So most of them are um, unpaid, at least partially. So some of them are paid full time, some of them are paid part time. But a lot of the time that they that they do is um, is volunteer. And Lee's company does provide a contribution time, but I know that a lot of the time that he does spend is in his own time. He's not getting paid for that. Um, and also, most of the things that these guys end up doing is review, which is not that much fun. And I think in many cases, they wish they were able to write more code. But um, that's sort of the thankless job of a committer. And yeah, I also just want to say, um, to, to kind of call out, as I mentioned, Lee's company, Previous Next, does pay for some of his time. They also fund another core committer, Vicky Spaniolo, who's quiet one on Drupal.org, and you know other companies like Acquia that are actually spending money on this. And it's really important, I think, to call that out because I don't think that the Drupal release cycle would be what it is, as, as reliable and as robust as it is without those companies paying for it. So just some quick stats from Drupal 8. Um, 3,750 contributors. Um, so there's a, a big group of contributors. I mean, that's actually a drop in the bucket when you think about how many people are using Drupal. So that number actually seems small to me now in hindsight. And then um, 270 of those people worked on more than 20 issues. So that's 7% of which um, Lee and I are in that, in that group. And then the 128 worked on more than 50. And that would be uh, certainly the 3% includes Lee, but I don't think me. So yeah, I mean, we consider ourselves part of the us for sure. We um, we contribute in different ways, and our contributions vary greatly depending on what's happening in our lives. So as I said, I took a year off from work in general where I did absolutely nothing, and then I came back and I was like, hey, I'm back. What can I do? Um, and that's totally fine. You know, there's nobody that's going to be sending you an email saying, oh, what's going on? You know, your your commit rate has dropped. Uh, you know, you don't have you don't have someone breathing down your neck because there is a, definitely a, a very very healthy respect for the fact that. Um, you're volunteering your time. So there's really no sort of set expectation. And um, I also just want to call out that there actually is a lot that one person can do. So um, just really quickly, an initiative is is kind of a, it's just a loose term that we use to describe a, a, a like a targeted um, attempt to achieve some goal, whether it's adding a new system in core or a new feature, or um, the one that Lee proposed back in 2020, about three years ago. Uh, Lee proposed this initiative called Bug Smash, which was really just an attempt to get the number of open bugs in Drupal core down from what it was, which was very, very high. So he noticed that in um, the list of patches for core in his composer uh, files was just getting longer and longer. And you know, every time there's a reroll, you have to update you know, your builds fail and all that kind of stuff. So he just thought there's got to be a better way. And he also figured that um, bugs are easier to review because they're quite clear and contained, whereas a feature could go round and round and round, and um, the scope is kind of unclear. Bugs are, are kind of a little bit more concise. So Lee started that. It was, it was genuinely just a, hey, guys, I've got this idea. Does anybody object? And um, of course, everybody thought it was a great idea. And now three years later, these stats, I think, speak for themselves. So 809 issues are actually fixed because of the Bug Smash uh, initiative. And um, more than 3,000 worked up, more than 3,000 closed. So that could be closed because they're duplicates or um, closed because they were outdated. And then um, almost 6,000 issues worked on, and we've got four, 541 people in our um, Slack channel. The other one then is the Needs Review Queue initiative, which was started by Stephen Musgrave just back in November. And he had 
this idea because he found that the needs review queue was had more than 2,700 issues in it. And as somebody who was frequently contributing, he felt like his issues were just kind of getting lost in the wash. So he said, there's got to be something we can do to make this a little bit more manageable. And he pretty much single-handedly has made this happen. So other people are helping, and um, there has been definitely participation, but it's nowhere near the scale of the bug smash um, kind of community. But um, amazingly, they've touched almost 2,000 issues. They've fixed 419, and um, there are currently, as of an hour ago, only 22 issues marked needs review in the Drupal core queue, which is down from 2,700. Yeah, in three months, yeah. So, um, so why not you? Uh, if you're, you know, if you if you're feeling like you're in the in the camp of like, no, that's that's them, not me. Um, then this next part is for you just to kind of get a um, maybe a, a place to start. So I'll hand you back to Lee for that. Thanks, Pam. So as Pam mentioned before, with her contribution journey, it all starts with an issue. Uh, this is the QR code to the issue queue. Uh, and the next time you think, wow, that's annoying, or why doesn't this feature exist, um, think about how you can help or what you can do to help move that forward. So first of all would be to go to this issue queue and search to see if someone else has had the same problem. And if they have, then maybe follow it up or um, follow along, make a comment, or see what the next steps are and see if you can help any of those. A lot of the issues will be stuck on needs review or stuck on uh, needs manual testing or, or you know things that for all, all different skill sets, it's not just development. Um, and so if, if an issue doesn't exist, you could create one, or it just could be a simple issue to improve some documentation. You might have found something that was really difficult to understand, and then you worked out, and you think the docs could be improved. And if you're not sure, uh, ask in Slack. There's nearly 600 people in the Australian New Zealand Slack channel. Through this conference, you can get some faces to go with the names, and you feel comfortable uh, messaging people in there. Um, and I was, as I said before, I was a bit of a lurker, and so chime in when you feel comfortable. 90% of the issue discourse is, is fairly civil, and there's little risk of drama as long as you're polite and you follow the process and um, be respectful. But I think one of the, the big issues is knowing who to ask, and hopefully out of come to this session, you now know at least two people you can know to ask, and we may not know the answer, but we might know who to ask, and so we're happy to help direct you towards the people that might have a better answer than us. Core is, is very large, and we're not going to pretend to say we know, know everything about it, and, but there are people who know their uh, specific subsystems. Um, and then we also have a, a separate issue queue for the ideas queue, and that's where bigger ticket items, so more blue sky thinking goes in there, and we kind of agree to work on that before uh, people start committing resources to it. So. Um, before you do get involved, I encourage you to try and think about why you want to contribute. Uh, we spoke about our motivation. Um, maybe you want to learn. Maybe you want to improve your reputation or your profile in the community. Maybe you want to network or friendship. Uh, maybe you, you want to ensure Drupal's livelihood. Or maybe you just want to fix something that interests you. In terms of why should you contribute, um, We've got a lot out of it. For me, I learned a lot of PHP. So when I started contributing to Drupal 8, I had no idea what a namespace was or what an interface was or what a unit test was. And I learned all that stuff through putting up patches and getting people who knew more than me to review that and provide constructive feedback. Um, I also then started reviewing other people's patches. And you read someone else's code and you look at something that you've not seen before and you take that as a jumping off point to learn some more. Uh, Pam, do you want to talk about multilingual stuff? Or? Oh, yeah, well, I just. I Obviously, it being in Australia, we don't have much opportunity to build multilingual sites, but we actually recently had a requirement on a, a project, and I was able to completely build a multilingual site from scratch with almost no um, sort of assistance because I'd done so many issue triages of multilingual issues. So that's purely, um, you know, you, you open an issue, it's got steps to reproduce, you, you go through the steps to reproduce, and from that alone, I learned how to build a multilingual site. So yeah, definitely, there's huge value in it besides just the, the, the gratification of um, giving back. I think one of the other sort of non-tangible benefits is the karma that you get in the community. Um, if you've earned karma from contribution and people recognize your username and you have, a, um, let's say, a specific issue in a module that, you know, you know the maintainer um, on Slack and you can message them and ask for help, even if it's specific help to your project, you're probably going to get uh, more traction if you've uh, built some of that karma than you would if you just went to a support channel and, you know, and asked off the blue, out of the blue, sorry. And again, yeah, networking and friendship. Uh, there's a there's a 
really uh, large community of really smart people all around the world building this, and we can honestly say we build a lot of connections with people out of it. And so that's the uh, the why, but how about the how? And I think one of the, the easiest ways to get started is just to get into a habit. Um, I try to do certain things on certain days because, uh, as Pam mentioned, there's a lot of reviewing, so I try to do that on a Monday and Tuesday, and then maybe on Wednesday I work on contrib projects, and Thursday I might work on some patches, and Friday I might work on security team stuff, but I like to keep a, a routine. Uh, Pam, she likes to uh, use the triage sometimes for a change of scenery or distraction, so it might be just finished a client call and need something to reset, might go into the bug smash and get a random issue to triage and that kind of is a nice change of scenery. Um, yeah, I think if you put in that small investment regularly, it, it won't happen overnight, but it does happen. And as I said before, about asking and learning. So you should check egos at the door and do not be afraid to ask questions. So this is from two months ago. Um, I introduced myself as the core framework manager but there was a patch from someone about Postgres and I didn't understand what that was. I didn't have any knowledge of Postgres, haven't used it for 15 years. So here I quite clearly ask, uh, can you explain to me what it's doing? And this is uh, Daffy, who's the, one of the subsystem maintainers for the database system, more than happily explains that to me. And I go away from that issue having learned something. So um, if you're unsure or uncomfortable, just ask. But most people in the issue queue are willing to politely explain their patch or their issue to you if you ask politely. I also encourage you to, to find your niche. Uh, there's something that interests you or something you have expertise in or something you care about, or in my case, forum, something no one cared about. Um, find something that annoys you in a job. Like if, if something frustrates you every day, um, for me getting involved with the block content module was born out of frustration with having to write update books in, in Drupal 7 to deploy blocks. Um, bug splash needs review, the same thing. Stephen's motivation was to, no one was reviewing his patches and there was 2,700 things to review. It's very hard for someone to find that. And then the final thing is to, uh, to work in an initiative to help find your feet faster. We talked about bug splash, we talked about needs review, but there's a lot of community initiatives. When you're working in a team, um, it's much easier to see traction because you've got multiple people working towards the same thing. Uh, building a contribution culture in your organisation, Pam mentioned before about previous next. Uh, if you're a business owner or a leader here or you're senior in your company, um, you can try and build this culture of contribution and start with celebrating things internally. At previous next, when someone gets something committed, we all you know, have a message and say congratulations and you know, make a big deal out of it. Uh, it can be from the smallest thing for a first patch to you know, a big subsystem like um, changes to the revision API that got into Drupal 10.1. This just gives visibility internally in the company and sort of uh, communicates that it's something that is important and valuable. Uh, fun time for it, if you can, um, and integrate it into your client bids. So let's say you are uh, responding to an RFQ and there's a feature in it that you know doesn't exist, and, but it's, there's a patch for it or it's 80% along. And when you go for that bid, include time to try and get that across the line. You might not get it across the line, but you might move it forward and the next company that comes along might get it across the line. Uh, and talk openly with your clients about it. A lot of our clients are happy to support open source contribution. A lot of them um, have their own project, uh, their own profile page on Drupal.org that lists their contributions and, they, and they're very proud of those. Um, so yeah, just don't think that it's uh, okay, there's no solution, let's not bother. Um, and then one final thing. Yeah, I just want to also throw this out there because I think that um, a lot of organizations think, well, we don't, we don't have time, we don't have the resources, we don't, we don't even have devs that actually can contribute patches to Drupal. Um, if your team is not able to do that, you can definitely find someone who is and you can pay them to do it on your behalf. So um, we had a situation years ago where a client wanted a feature in web form that was not built and you know, we had developers that were more than capable of doing it, but felt that they probably weren't the best people to do it in order to roll it back into Webform module. So we reached out to the maintainer of Drupal 7 Webform, and we offered him some money to build the feature that we wanted. And he did it, and the feature went into the Webform module. The client got what they wanted. The you know Dan got paid, and um, now that feature was available for everybody to use. So I really just want to make that option very clear that there's no there's no sort of official channel for this to happen, but there are plenty of developers out there who would love to get paid for their contributions. So I do think that, you know, as much as we're talking about, you know, contributing to core and talking about volunteering, 
there is no expectation that anyone in the world just should volunteer their time for free. And we, I, I don't want that to be your takeaway. I'm, I certainly am making a living off of this. I suspect that the rest of you are too, all of, most if not all of you. And so there is money out there circulating. Um, and if there's something that's really annoying you, if there's a bug you want to fix or if there's a feature, it's definitely an option to pay to have that. So that's our, our sort of final note. And I mean, the fact that you're here, we hope you have some interest in, in joining us. Um, if you're, you know, if, if you were just looking for a push, we hope that this helped. And um, as Lee said, now at least you know who we are. And if you have any questions or um, now or later, you know, we're on Slack all the time. And, um, and yeah, we're around. So.